Tom Cruise has been one of the biggest movie stars in the world for nearly 40 years now. He's excelled at action movies, dramas, comedies, science fiction. He's worked with many of our greatest directors like Ridley Scott, Martin Scorsese, Oliver Stone, Brian De Palma, Stanley Kubrick, and Paul Thomas Anderson, to name a few. He's one of the best-known film stars there has ever been, and yet there's something that has eluded Tom Cruise ever since his film debut in 1981, winning an Academy Award. In his long career, he's been nominated three times in the lead actor category for 1989's Born on the Fourth of July and 1996's Jerry Maguire, and in the supporting actor category for 1999's Magnolia. Each time he won the Golden Globe for his performance, but never did he go on to win the Oscar. How did this happen? And how close did he come to Oscar victory? In this video, I'm going to talk about Tom Cruise's remarkable career and discuss the reasons why he's never won the elusive Academy Award. First, let's start at the beginning. Born on July 3rd, 1962, Tom Cruise was raised by his father Thomas and mother Mary. He first became involved in drama in fourth grade, and he appeared in his high school's production of Guys and Dolls. At age 18, he made his way to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career, where he signed with CAA and appeared in two 1981 films, Endless Love and Taps. But 1983 marked his breakthrough, appearing in four movies, including All the Right Moves and The Outsiders, and then there was Risky Business, the movie that put him on the map, starring Cruz as a Chicago teenager looking for fun at home while his parents are away. Don't steal anything. You know, if I come back here and I find anything missing, I'm going straight to the police. I'm not joking. The film was too lightweight for Cruz to be seriously considered for his first Oscar nomination, but he did receive his first nomination at the Golden Globes for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Comedy, or Musical. By early 1984, Tom Cruise was well on his way. He next worked with Ridley Scott on the fantasy film Legend, and in 1986 he appeared in two box office hits, one a summer action vehicle, Top Gun, and one a fall release drama, The Color of Money. Okay, look, Eddie, look, hey. It's my attitude, right? Okay, from now on, attitude. Eddie, I Bullshit. swear to you. No, no, Kiddo, no, no you always do what you want to do. Don't tell me if that, If I say Eddie, you look, do this, you do that. Don't tell me that. I try I'm to do tired. everything. I, I try to do everything that you tell me to do. If audiences didn't know the name Tom Cruise by now, they definitely knew it, and knew it well, by 1986. He was never going to win any awards for Top Gun, but the closest he got to his first Oscar nomination thus far had to have been for The Color of Money, directed by Martin Scorsese, since it earned Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio a Best Supporting Actress nomination, and it won Paul Newman his only competitive Oscar. In this story of fast Eddie Felsen teaching a cocky protege the ropes of pool hustling, Cruz probably didn't get very far in awards recognition because all the focus in the film was on Newman, and Cruz's role was probably too big to be considered in the supporting actor category. Tom Cruise didn't slow down, and he didn't disappoint, coming back in 1988 with two more blockbusters, the summer release Cocktail, and the end of the year release Rain Man, directed by Barry Levinson. How'd you do that? I don't know. You memorize the whole book? No. You start from the beginning? Yeah. How far did you get? G. G? G, God sake, William Marsh, God sake. You memorized to G? Yeah, G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G, half a G. That's good, Ray. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. If he got close to the Oscars with The Color of Money, Cruz came even closer with Rain Man, which once again received wins and nominations for other people involved with the movie, but not Cruz. This film, about a man who discovers his estranged father left a fortune to his autistic brother, received eight Oscar nominations and won screenplay, director, actor for Dustin Hoffman, and picture. The only major component to the movie who didn't win was Cruz, who, once again, wasn't even nominated. And just like The Color of Money, Cruz likely didn't get an Oscar nomination for Rain Man because his role was too large to be considered in the supporting category. For a few years there, Cruz had to stay on the sidelines and watch his co-stars Paul Newman and Dustin Hoffman achieve Oscar glory, but when was it going to be his moment? Well, he finally had his first chance at winning the Academy Award the following year when he starred in Oliver Stone's highly acclaimed Born on the Fourth of July in which Cruz plays the real-life Ron Kovic, who was paralyzed in the Vietnam War 
and became an anti-war political activist. Would you people help me, huh? What's the matter with you? I don't feel right. I don't feel right either. I need to see the doctor. I need to see him now! Not available. I want to see him now! Me. This time, Cruz wasn't sharing the screen with an acting legend. He was the whole show. Cruz front and center with a character deeply realized with so many compelling dramatic shades to his performance. In early 1990, Born on the Fourth of July became the frontrunner to win the Oscar for Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actor after the film swept at the Golden Globes, winning in all the top categories. This is a huge acknowledgement, not only to me, but to the cast and crew who gave everything they had every day. Oliver Stone won the DGA award that season, and Cruz was nominated for his first, and still to date, only BAFTA award, and then came the Oscar nominations. Eight in total, like Rain Man, the film spread across the board in categories like picture and director, along with cinematography, sound, and John Williams' original score. And there it was, Tom Cruise's first Oscar nomination, this one in the leading actor category, for his stellar performance. One of the best in his celebrated career. You were um, no doubt honored by the nomination. Were you surprised at all? I, yeah, I think I was. You know, very much. I mean, uh, it's an extraordinary thing to be nominated for an Academy Award, and uh, I don't think you take anything like that for granted. I would say of the three Oscar nominations Cruz received, this is the one he had the greatest chance in winning. The SAG Awards didn't exist yet, so there wasn't another actor to win that and steal his thunder. In Born on the Fourth of July, he plays a real person, always a plus when you're trying to win the big award, and the film's director, Oliver Stone, was hot off his Best Picture winning Platoon from a few years prior. Stone did indeed win his second Oscar for Best Director for Born on the Fourth of July, and the film also took Best Editing. But something happened in between the Golden Globes on January 20th, 1990, and the Academy Awards two months later on March 26th. A couple other films gained an awards momentum. The first was Driving Miss Daisy, released in December, which didn't get a Director Oscar nomination, but still overperformed, with nine nominations total, Jessica Tandy, the immediate frontrunner to win Best Actress. The film's picture win over Born on the Fourth of July hasn't exactly aged well, but at the time, clearly audiences and Academy voters were ready to award something that made them feel good. And when it came to Best Actor, what prevented Tom Cruise from taking the prize? Three words, my friends. Daniel Day-Lewis. His film My Left Foot broke late in the season, receiving a qualifying release in November 1989, but not going wide in theaters across the country until late February 1990, during the crucial time of Oscar voting, when people could finally discover Day-Lewis's terrific lead performance. The actor's stature had been building throughout the 1980s with acclaimed terms in My Beautiful Laundrette, A Room with a View, and The Unbearable Lightness of Being. It was probably close, but enough people were seeing My Left Foot at the right time to push Day-Lewis over the top to win his first of eventually three Best Actor Academy Awards. Not to say that Tom Cruise was in any way feeling sorry for himself. He already had 1990's Days of Thunder in the can, and then in 1992 he gave us two more giant dramas. One was a rare flop for Cruise, Ron Howard's Far and Away, but the other was a gargantuan hit, A Few Good Men, which made $250 million worldwide on a $40 million budget. Telling the story of two U.S. Marines charged with the murder of a fellow Marine, A Few Good Men, written by Aaron Sorkin and directed by Rob Reiner, pulled together an extraordinary ensemble of actors that included Cruz, Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, and Kevin Bacon, and it features one of the most iconic scenes of Cruz's career. Colonel Jessup, did you order the Code Red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Of the potential Oscar nominations Cruz did not receive, I would argue he came closest to securing a lead actor nomination for A Few Good Men. The December release kept the film fresh in the minds of Academy voters, and Cruz's Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama would have put him in the running for an Oscar nomination, especially with such a beloved movie. But then, somehow, he missed out despite the film receiving Oscar nominations for Best Picture and Best Supporting Actor for Nicholson. He followed A Few Good Men with the hit films The Firm and Interview with the Vampire, both movies earning Oscar nominations, like Holly Hunter and the Supporting Actress Race for The Firm and Best Art Direction for Interview with the Vampire, but Cruz was never seriously considered as an Oscar nominee for either. But thankfully, next up was Tom Cruise's most impressive year as a movie star yet, 
1996. Never before or since has he given us two giant hits in a single year that also earned him an Oscar nomination for one of them. I would argue 1996 marks the pinnacle of Cruz's career, with him kicking off his most lucrative movie franchise in Mission Impossible and giving one of his best performances in Cameron Crowe's Jerry Maguire, about a sports agent fired from his job after he has a moral epiphany. I love you. You? Complete me. And I just... Had... Shut up. Just shut up. You had me at hello. Cruz's role in Born on the Fourth of July might have been the more transformative, but his role of Jerry Maguire is still a total masterclass, one that shows his range of comedy and drama. The end of the year release was immediately thrown into the awards discussion, especially after Cruz won the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. I want to thank Cameron. Uh, you know, you gave me Jerry Maguire, man. You take a, made a movie out of little moments, moments that people would you know, not feel worthy to put on film or interesting enough, and, and you turn it into this, this, these gems, these things I've never seen before. So thank you. You are a total original. And thank you for Jerry Maguire. Thank you for that role. The film earned three Screen Actors Guild Award nominations, and then it became the only major studio film to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Cuba Gooding Jr. was the big Jerry Maguire Oscar winner that night for his showy supporting performance, but unfortunately Cruz never had a sincere chance to win because of Jeffrey Rush's extraordinary dramatic turn in Shine as the real-life pianist David Helfgott. With seven Oscar nominations, including picture and director, Shine was slightly better liked by the Academy than Jerry Maguire, and Rush had won every major precursory needed, including the Golden Globe Award, Critics' Choice Award, BAFTA Award, and SAG Award. Cruz's Globe win in the comedy category just wasn't going to cut it this year in the face of Rush's impressive sweep, and so once again, Cruz had to stay in his seat, smile and clap, when Rush took the Oscar stage in early 1997. After his amazing year, Cruz could have gone the easy route and done a middle-of-the-road thriller or something, but instead he took on one of his most intimidating projects ever, a sexual drama directed by the one and only Stanley Kubrick. For more than a decade, Cruz had appeared in a film almost every year, but there was a long three-year gap this time because filming on Eyes Wide Shut took from 1996 to 1998, a whopping 400 days, still a record for a studio movie. Cruz plays a Manhattan doctor who embarks on a late-night journey to a mysterious mansion party after his wife expresses feelings of unfulfilled longing for another man. Victor, what can I say? Uh, I had absolutely no idea you were involved in any way. This is one of my favorite Cruise films by far. Kubrick's touch felt throughout every hypnotic scene, the sequence at the mansion especially mesmerizing. But upon its release in the summer of 1999, just months after Kubrick's death, Eyes Wide Shut received positive, but not exactly celebratory reviews from most critics. And by awards time, it only managed a score nomination at the Globes, and shockingly, not a single Oscar nomination. But that's not to say Tom Cruise sat this award season out. He had one more surprise in store in December 1999 with Paul Thomas Anderson's ambitious, absorbing masterpiece, Magnolia, which features my all-time favorite Cruise performance, a celebrity motivational speaker, Frank T.J. Mackey, who teaches seminars to men on how to score with women. You are betting this thought. I am the one who's in charge. I am the one who says yes, no, now. Here. In a career of so many excellent performances, this is the one that's always stuck with me. Cruz infusing this charismatic creep with just the right amount of empathy. And I think his minimum amount of screen time enhances the performance too. A couple of hours with this guy would have been too much. But in moderate amounts, Cruz steals the show and then some. There are the early scenes where his charm keeps you invested in Anderson's long, unbroken shots. There are the interview scenes where you can see emotion building up inside. And there are the later scenes with his father, played by Jason Robards, where Cruz breaks down crying and totally owns every second of this character's immense pain. 
This was the performance that should have earned Cruz his Oscar, and after he won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor, it looked like he might finally have a shot at the gold trophy. You know, most of all, I've got to talk about Paul Thomas Anderson, who <laughs> was quite, quite brilliant, and he came and visited me on Eyes Wide Shut and called me two months later and said, listen, I've written this role for you, and you know, I just thank you for bringing me along, and thank you for putting me in the scene with the great Jason Robarts, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I was almost in a scene with Julianne Moore. <laughs> but as the 2000 award season continued, Harvey Weinstein and company began to work their magic on a little movie called The Cider House Rules, which became the anointed Miramax Oscar contender that year, and Michael Caine's supporting role went along for the ride. Caine lost the Golden Globe to Cruz, but then Caine won the SAG Award for Male Actor in a Supporting Role, and he got nominated at BAFTA, which Cruz didn't. Something in the air was clearly shifting, and by Oscar night, Cruz winning seemed less and less likely. Partly due to the Miramax Oscar money machine, which Kane ultimately benefited from to win his second Oscar, but also because of two more things. Cruz's turn in Magnolia was enormously impressive, but his controversial, unlikable character might have rubbed enough Academy voters the wrong way. And Cruz is also thought of so much as the leading man in the movies that a win in the supporting category might have felt odd for some voters too and therefore Kane managed an Oscar win, his words to Cruz from the stage perfectly fitting. You have Tom, who if you had won this, your pot price would have gone down so fast. <laughs> <laughs> have you any idea what supporting actors get paid? <laughs> and as they say, that's that. It's been 22 years since Tom Cruise's last Oscar nomination, and if there's one thing he cares about at this point in his career, it's certainly not winning an Academy Award. For a while after Magnolia, he continued taking interesting, well-drawn characters, like David and Cameron Crowe's underrated drama Vanilla Sky, and like Nathan in Edward Zwick's The Last Samurai, a film that earned Cruise a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama. Cruise worked with Steven Spielberg twice, the Better Film and Performance Absolutely Minority Report from 2002, and there's his inspired comedic supporting performance in Tropic Thunder, which also gave Cruz a Golden Globe nomination. The best performance Cruz has given since Magnolia, I think, is his villainous role in Michael Mann's Collateral as a gray-haired contract killer who takes a cab driver hostage one late night in Los Angeles. What you, what you doing? I'm gonna off the roof. Huh? Can't leave him here, so unless you want him up front with you, but given the hygiene... Oh. Okay, it's only a dead guy. Grab his hands. I can't do this. Grab his wrists. This is the kind of magnetic, against-type Cruise performance I wish we got more of today. The actor taking risks and showing different sides of his screen persona. Jamie Foxx managed a supporting actor Oscar nomination for his performance in the film. Still super bizarre category fraud, given that Foxx is essentially in every scene of the movie, but Cruise deserved to be in the awards conversation too. Unfortunately, in the last 15 years, there's just been nothing to nominate Cruz for. After a few examples of a swing and a miss, with 2007's Lions for Lambs, 2008's Valkyrie, and 2012's Rock of Ages, Cruz has settled into being an action movie star, more interested in churning out blockbuster hits than anything else. There's been lots of Mission Impossible movies, a couple of Jack Reacher movies, his disastrous reimagining of The Mummy, and his inspired Groundhog Day-like action extravaganza, Edge of Tomorrow. Cruz's only performance of the last decade I would consider offbeat and slightly change of pace is his turn in Doug Liman's American Maid, as the real-life Barry Seal, an American pilot who became a drug runner for the CIA. All right, what I'm about to tell you, now, you, you, you gotta swear you can't ever tell anybody this, Lucy. All right? Alas, the film was just too forgettable to make any mark during award season. Cruz ultimately just doesn't seem that interested anymore in that elusive Oscar. And you know what? That's okay. He remains one of the biggest movie stars in the world, still able to bring audiences into the theater and droves. After a four-year absence from theater screens since 2018's Mission Impossible Fallout, he has Top Gun Maverick finally coming out later this month, and then two more Mission Impossible movies in the coming years after that. 
Tom Cruise is here to stay, and although I personally wish he held more interest in pursuing and greenlighting more daring dramatic fare outside the action movie realm, his list of film credits and directors he's worked with and characters he's played is hard for anyone of his stature to equal. And who knows? I mean, the man is turning 60 years old this summer. His days as an action movie hero, one who runs and runs and runs and runs can't go on forever, right? Maybe some late career dramatic roles are still coming. Maybe Cruz's elusive Oscar will one day be his. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments below, what is your favorite Tom Cruise performance? Do you think he should have won an Oscar by now? See you next time.